to hear from my friend, my brother in Christ, Pastor Juan Carlos. Juan, can you, you come up, please, my friend, my brother? Yeah, please stand. Please do that. I'm sorry I've got to switch mics here. Okay. 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 Amen. Dios te bendiga mucho. Can you guys hear me? Uh, no, that's fine. <laughs> you don't have to. I heard this great story about a black brother and a white brother. They love the Lord incredibly with amazing passion. And they both. Uh, oh, okay. So, the children, 4 to 11, I'm sorry, I forgot. You're released to go for children's ministry. It's Pastor Ray, Pastor Tim. Just follow over that way. We have an awesome children's ministry. I'm sorry, my dear friend. My, my bad, my bad. We're changing some things up. Y'all give the kids a hand if they want to. That's wonderful. That's a great generation right there. Uh, well, some of you may, uh, may hear that I have an accent, a record recorder accent, I guess I was born in Cuba. And, um, but I was going to tell you a story that a black brother and a, a white brother, they love the Lord passion and they both die. And they go to heaven and when they are sitting in the lobby, before they get into the big room to see the Lord Jesus, they're arguing. They have, they pick up this, it's not an argument, they were debating it. Uh, the black brother says, you know, Jesus is black. You want to see him? He's going to come and black Jesus. And then the white brother brought here, but I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Jesus is white. So they're going back and forth. Jesus is black. Jesus is white. And in the middle of their debate and their conversation, the door opens up, and St. Peter walks in and says, ladies and gentlemen, let's just give a uh, welcome to our Lord. So when Jesus walks in in the room, he said, buenos dias. The Lord is Anyway. But, um, I want to say thank you to uh, my dear friend and Pastor Jerry Davis. Uh, when I was about four years old, I got stuck in, a little, in an elevator with my sister. My sister's 14 years older than me, and she was about 20, and I was about four. And we got stuck in an elevator in a hospital, and uh, it was a very frightening experience. And I have this picture, this image, of my sister pushing buttons, and that elevator was going up and down. I never forget that. It was so claustrophobic. And years later, I learned one thing, that relationships in your life are like the buttons in the elevator. Regarding your wishes, you pressure to go up or down. You know, and uh, when I met your pastor here back in 1993, uh, in your journey, you meet a lot of wonderful people. I mean, it's incredible. You meet people with, you know, incredible abilities to express the love of God and uh, convey truth and revelation. And after you meet it, your life is never the same again. And I met a lot of wonderful people in my life. I have been a blessed man. God has brought across my path incredible, phenomenal people. What I have to say that I have, after the millions of people I think I've seen face to face, I have two friends only in my life. One is my friend Nick Couturich, uh, which is down in, uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. And the other one is my friend Pastor Jerry Davis. Uh, we have the deepest talk. Uh, and we can open up, it is a blessing when you can open up with somebody and go back and forth and exchange great experiences, bad experiences, bad orders when you're sleeping in the same room, uh, you know, uh, uh, debate all kinds of things. And what is even more wonderful is when you have opposing views in certain areas and yet both of you guys grow yes. and encourage each other. That is a blessing that I have no words to describe that. So that's the relationship I have with him. He just came in my life in the season. Actually, he was the first mentor I had. He was the first person that ushered me to ministry in the United States of America. Glorify so many viewpoints for me. I used to say, the one thing you do not know, uh, because I was passionately debating things that I didn't know. And after the years, those things have proven to be solid, outstanding truth. So you have a wonderful pastor. I really love him. And uh, you, did, you made so many good things happen in my life. You know, and I want to thank you for that. Because you really brought so much joy to ministry. Ministry can be intense. I don't know how many of you know that. It can be intense, intense, intense. It can make you grow old before time if you're not careful. It can make you have bitterness if you don't have a whole heart. I mean, it can do a lot of different things for you. But also, Jerry brought to my life that sort of ministry which you enjoy ministry. You do what you do for the Lord and you do it with pleasure and joy. So anyway, 
And then recently I made a group for white Pastor Shelley, and this is an incredible woman. This is the type of woman I like. She is sold out for Christ, full of God, full of faith. Uh, she's passionate, and she's right at my, my same DNA. So Pastor Shelley, take my heart off to you. Uh, thank you so much for being uh, real. And uh, I told her, you're a prophet of God. There's something inside of you that is incredible. But uh, listen, I'm so full after 27 years of walking with the Lord and seeing things. Uh, I'm walking in the realm of the supernatural. I'm a scientist. I study biology and I had the privilege to work around a lot of big thinkers. And in a realm uh, where we work, uh, people stumble with the word supernatural because they equate supernatural with irrational. But for me, supernatural is not irrational. For me, supernatural is a breaking away from the tyranny of the ordinary. Yeah. You know, it's something that goes beyond. Actually, it's supernatural for you and me, but for God is not. What is natural for God is what you call supernatural. So for God to do something that for you appears to be supernatural is his modus operandi. That's the way God works. You know, so uh, there's nothing that you're going through today that God cannot solve. There's no sickness that he cannot heal. Uh, there's no financial situation that he cannot solve. I mean, so there's nothing that you can have or going through at this moment that God can know through his intervention, make a way for it in your life. I want you to know that. But I want to share with you a few testimonies. And uh, uh, I'm a married man. I've been married for 20 years. My wife and I have two children. Or should I say she had them? I just have to raise them. Uh, but we've been in several countries around the world. And we have had the privilege to see God doing great things. I believe that Christianity is a believing lifestyle. Uh, it's something that conveys strength, it conveys life. And in the mouth of some of the apostles, they say that that which we have seen, heard, and handled, according to the word of life, this is what we communicate to you. So after the years, we have learned to communicate not what we believe is right, but what we have seen and we have tested and proved as something that is truthful and has the power to really change people. You know, and the, the way I want to do this today, because after so many years of ministry, I'm full. I, I can be here talking for 10 hours, and you will not like it. Uh, but I'm going to try to con uh, condense all this stuff in three sessions. I'm going to give you some testimonies. I'm going to break down some Bible verses in a very simple way, and then I'm going to pray for you. That's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to turn it back I mean, to Pastor Gary. But uh, let me give you small synopsis of my life, so you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, back when I was 18 years old, I was a bodybuilder, I was studying, I was a musician, I was a lot of things at the same time. You know, and I learned something in life that if you keep aiming or nothing, you hit it every time. So you have to be very specific in the calling of your life. You know, you cannot be a fire, you cannot be such a multi-talented, multi-class person, because, you know, there's an old saying that says, grass ball, blue soul. So you really have to be a laser. I remember when the Lord told me, you need to go from being a fire to be a laser. Because when you're a fire, God assigns you. Suppose that God tells you, I want you to come and burn the speaker. And as a fire, you come, you burn the speaker. But you burn the stage, you burn uh, 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 the leaves, you burn the pulp, you burn me. You know, so there's a lot of collateral damage when you are a fire for God. You know, it used to be that you're a fire for God. That was a good term, it's a good thing. Well, it's not a good thing. I mean, it brings a lot of damage. You know, so I remember the day the Lord told me, I want you to be a laser, because the laser comes and as God said, hits that, the laser comes and hits that, yeah. and it doesn't matter how many other things are close to that, they remain intact. Yeah. You know, so God is not in the business of causing collateral damage that you build his kingdom. Right. You know, uh, he came to save. So, I, I was used to do so many things at the time, but I remember before, four years before I got saved, I was holding a bottle of Cuban rum. It's a very famous Cuban rum. Uh, do I miss it? No. Did I have a good time with it? Yeah. Because I really do a sinning. Some people didn't do it a sin. I did. I really had a wonderful time sinning. Uh, uh, I thank Jesus that I got saved. You know, so I'm holding a bottle of rum in my hand. I have a guy, a friend of mine, this Ivan, with me that is an engineer. And we were dating two girls. I was dating two girls and he was dating two girls at the same time. And it was okay. I mean, that's, that's what you do in the world. You know, and but all of a sudden there's a beautiful uh, sunset. We're at the beach, and I have an utterance, and I made this comment. I said, "Look at that beautiful sun. It seems like the sun is warming up the water. There has to be a great God is so great." Now remember, I was not a Christian, but I made that that utterance. God is so great because there's something great. The Bible says that God has, has made everything beautiful in its time, and He has set eternity in the hearts of men. You know, you don't need to know Jesus personally to really know that there's a God. 
you know now knowing Jesus personally is the goal but I mean God is just is undeniable and I made a statement and across from where I was standing with those friends a guy stood up and this guy was the son of the Cuban general that used to be part of the Cuban revolution and he got up and rebuked me and said you're proselytizing you know that in Cuba we walk by the precepts of the revolution and just mentioning that God created the world that's something that you should not say in this place so we began to have this argument while I'm arguing with the guy I had a vision I never had visions you know and I had like an opening in my head and I saw myself wearing khaki pants a blue blazer a white shirt I was holding the microphone and I was standing on the stage and I was speaking to now I said I was preaching at that time I didn't know what was that I saw myself speaking to thousands of people and I thought to myself he did I mean alcohol really I mean he's getting to me <laughs> because that was the most bizarre thing well to make a story short five years later I got saved and then eight years later I was in Mexico, in the town of Querétaro. I love Mexico very much. I don't know many Mexicans are here, but I've been in Mexico many times. And I was in the town of Querétaro, and I was holding a crusade that drew literally tens of thousands of people. And what was interesting is that that first day that I spoke, I had khaki pants, a blue blazer, and a white shirt, and the Lord brought back to my memory those times. So that's something that for you, you may say, well, what does that mean? I'm going to tell you what it means. God saved me with one purpose he says i want you to let people know what i'm capable to do for those who trust me yeah. you know and that uh, it's just an amazing thought that god saved us so we can share what god has done for us now when i got saved i was working at the institute of medical uh, uh the institute of tropical medicine we were doing research on antibiotics and proteins and things like that about um molecular biology and I remember that I was dating a woman, dating again, you know, I was a dater, uh, that was a doctor, she was seven years older than me, and the Communist Party called her and said, you know, you should not date this guy because this guy doesn't line up with our convictions and belief, you know, regarding, you know, the person of the Communist Party, and if you continue to date this guy, we want to kick you out. So she called me one day and said, I cannot date you anymore, and guess what happened to my little heart? Uh, you know, it did the thing. You know, I was just working hard. So I walked out to a church. It was a Methodist church. It was there than the door now. I do remember that. Uh, you know, it felt like a graveyard when you walk in there. And I went there and I nailed the altar and I had this person, Lord, if you give me Mercedes, that was her name, I'll serve you. And I had never read the word of God in my life at that time. And I heard a voice because, you know, God speaks and the Bible said that God will make his voice heard. God has a way to get your attention in many different ways. And I heard the voice of God when the Lord spoke to me and said, Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all the things shall be added to you. Well, God spoke to me in a language I understood, but I didn't know what I meant. You know, and uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all the things shall be added unto you. Well, uh, what is really interesting is that I didn't hear God say, Seek ye first and Mercedes shall be added unto you or this woman shall be given to you and that's what I was looking for but what got my attention is the word all the things shall be added unto you and I thought all the things shall be added to me what things shall be added to me so I became very curious and this is a true testimony I became very curious about what things God had to us well the Bible said that God has given us all things that pertain to life and Godliness and he says that he also has given us promises that through these promises we might become partakers of the divine nature. So the only way for you to understand the nature of God is to understand what God offers. Is to understand what God says. Because the word of God was written so it could be spoken, so it could be heard, so it could be applied. You know, so I began to research the word of God, the Bible, before I really raised my hand in the church to receive Jesus. That's an amazing story. So I began to serve the Lord. Then I joined the Methodist Church. It was very empty as I told you. And then I, I began to pray at the tower of the Methodist Church at 5 o'clock in the morning. Then two young people joined me. I was at the time 23 years old and another person I joined me was 17 and then was 20. So we began to pray and pray and pray up there and believe God. And one day we got filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean it was like something happened. We began to speak in a language that we didn't know and it was it was madness, it was crazy. I mean, what is going on here? We have no clue. But we thought something divine had happened. Because you know what? You might live in darkness for years and not know it. But the day you walk in the light, you know. I mean, you might be walking in darkness and you don't even know that you're... You don't even know what you need. But the day you begin to walk in the light, you go, God, 
what it's like to have the aha moment, that's what light does for you. Light has an amazing, light has a way to overcome your life in a way that is a, is a massive overtake, but is non-violent. Have you noticed that it's dark at night you're sleeping when the sun rises, all of a sudden light breaks out yeah. and darkness goes away and you don't even hear noise? Yeah. That's how light works. It comes into your life and it begins to displace and displace and displace and displace. Which that really happened to me and so to guys, but we have no idea what the Lord was fixing to do. We really have no idea. You know, because revelation is progressive. You know, God gives you things little by little. I mean, it really happens daily, not in a day. I mean, you sit in your yard to watch the grass grow. But it does that. You know, but the fact is growing every single day. Spiritual growth is the same. You may not feel that you've grown, but I clue you that you you have grown compared with six months ago. You're you're closer to God today. Now you may not feel closer, but it's irrelevant because God is not calling to walk by feelings. Even though you may not feel you've grown, you have to walk by faith and say, I've grown. I'm not a different, I'm just a different person. Well, I joined a Methodist church, and then all of a sudden I became the youth pastor in the church. Then we went to a place called Matanzas, which is in the middle of the country. And this was a gathering of 250 youth from all over, from 120 churches in that denomination. And there, something different happened. It was about 10.30 at night when we went to bed. And all of a sudden, this perfume, I walk in this room now, you need to understand the Cuban conditions at that time. There's no air conditioning. It's about 110 degrees in the summer. It's humid. I mean, you have no running waters until this Pastor Jerry knows what I'm talking about. You have no condition. You're surviving. You're not living. You're surviving in the moment. You know, and uh, people said, there's no deodorant. Pastor Jerry can tell you a story. Most people do not have toothpaste at that time. You know, so it's not that. We don't know what we have in America. We're really blessed. Actually, we're not blessed. We're spoiled. You know, so. We are, uh, I walked in this room that is packed with people, everybody's sweating. And when I walked in the room, this fragrance, this perfume overtakes the whole room. And, we, and people became sniffers. You know, like when people sniff something, that's what everybody was doing. Because we could not comprehend what was happening. And this fell on a group of 250 people. And we had it in our hands, in our clothes, everywhere. We're feeling this and we're talking and we're astonished, we're perplexed, we do not know what is going on. We have no idea. We left that place at 2.30 in the morning after praying and all over the camp, all over, and it was about 20 acres of land where that little seminar, you know, had, was built where we were having that convention. It was incredible. Young people began to be filled with the Holy Ghost. People began uh, to express uh, utterances from God, things that were unbelievable, undescribable. We knew one thing, we don't know what it is, but we know this is divine. So the reason why I tell you that is because that night I asked God, what is that? And I heard again the voice of God. I've heard the voice of God many times. He said, go read Psalm 45. I went to Psalm 45 and I read that it says that in his garments has this mirth, acacia, and frankincense fragrance and the Lord told me I was in the building and you smell my garments not only you 250 people smelled it now can you imagine for a guy like me very rational because sometimes when you're in the scientific world you suffer from the paralysis of the analysis I mean you're filtering I mean you're just analyzing everything that you become uh, uh, you become paralyzed because in, in, in the faithful life many times God is going to ask you for you to believe something that it may appear to be irrational to my pastor used to say that sometimes that will offend your mind to speak to your spirit. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's, there's a way that God deals with you and sometimes He asks you to do things that are uh, not comprehensible. But you know, there's something that is going to take place after you do something. And one thing to really see God doing great things in your life is you have to learn how to feel comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, many times God is going to ask you to take some steps, you know, and I don't know it all. There's so many things out there that I know about the life of God. But the things that I've seen, I can tell they're so tangible, so transforming, that they have changed the life of people around forever. Well, from that experience, that night it was a service, and we were praying, and I remember I fell down with the power of God. It was amazing. And this pastor, Pastor Moses, you know, came up to me prophesying, and he prophesied over me, and he said, the Lord says that he's going to use him. He began to say 
I have to say that I understood about 1% of all that he said. Because I was a new believer. I was walking to work. I had no idea. You know, but I knew that God was speaking to me. Well, uh, when I got up there, you know, it was an amazing change. And I learned something. That the power of God is just not manifesting when you fall down. But also when you stand up. Are you a different man? You know, and God is not into the experiential thing only. God is into, you know, uh, the consistent growth in character and maturity. That's an amazing concept. But I came out of that meeting with so much fire. And I'm closing these testimonies, but you need to know why. You know, I went back to my church in Havana. And the church grew from a group of 30, 40 people that we had to literally hundreds. Hundreds upon hundreds in a matter of three or four months. Then it became a church of the thousands, but we didn't have we had a building and couldn't fit thousands. Only uh, we could put only a thousand people there and underneath, and then people went to homes. But the church exploded. It was an incredible thing. I went to a town called Holguin, about six, uh, 600, 700 miles east of Havana, and something incredible happened. I was doing an event, and my mom calls me and said, "You need to." Do your best to come up here because you're having a massive heart attack. And they say you will not leave in the next 24 hours. And he's in the hospital. My dad and I were the closest people you can find. And Cuba has a major crisis. There's no transportation. I'm 700 miles away from the place. It's 8.30 at night when my mom is away. I can make it. And I broke out in tears like a baby. And the next day I got up at 5 o'clock and I went to the Bogin airport. And when I got there, the airport had been shut down for some reason. And I walk through this door and there's a military lady standing in the counter and I looked at her and said, my dad is dying. I mean, I need to go back to Havana. I said, can you put me in any flight? She said to me, the airport is just been closed and there's no way. I mean, it cannot happen. It will never happen. I mean, and if you sign up uh, in a waiting list for a flight, you will not be able to get on a plane till 10 days later. That's to give you an idea. You know, I said, there's no way it can happen. And when she told me so boldly, no, it's not going to happen, I turned around, and they had a glass door right here, and I faced the door, and I began to weep and cry. I said, Lord, you know, I've been serving you. I'm not just right you. I, you know, I'm not demanding anything, but I just want to let you know that I feel that you need to do something for me because it's out of the realm of my possibility. And I'm having this talk with God, like some of you have had that conversation at times. I don't have it, but I'm pouring out my heart. And all of a sudden, the back door swings wide open. And these two military personnel, one lieutenant colonel, never forgot his rank, and another colonel, walk out and they're arguing. And one of them is saying, this is the reason why this country nothing works. We're not organized. I mean, we do not know. I mean, who orders to follow? They're having this argument. And I notice that they go to the counter, they're talking to the lady, which is uh, the lady that you spoke to. And Five minutes after that, the lady calls me. She says, sir, and I was a 20, 25-year-old guy, and I walked in there, and she asked me this question. She looked at me, and she said, because you, everybody uh, does witchcraft and three, uh, they're Catholics, they're in spiritism, I mean, they do all kinds of stuff. And this lady came up to me and said, uh, what, what God do you serve? And I'm I'm taking aback at the, the question, what guy do I serve? I said, well, she said to me, do you serve Shango? Shango is an African uh, god that, you know, uh, they worship in Cuba. I said, no. And she said, do you worship about Allah? She, I said, none of that. I said, but i tell you something. I said, about five years ago, I gave my heart to Lord Jesus Christ, and I've been serving him for five years, my Lord and Savior, and I serve the only God of the universe. If that's the question you ask me, I'm not part of any religion. I'm part of a, an outstanding relationship with the Creator of the universe. And, you know, it's something that's interesting. God, this is something, you belong to God by reason of creation. But now that you serve Christ, you also belong to God by reason of redemption. Yeah. So you belong to Him twice. It's an amazing deal. You know, it's an, it's an incredible commitment that God has with the people not only He created, but with the people He recreated. Because it's what redemption is. It's a recreation of the Spirit. And this woman said to me, well, let me tell you how big is that God you serve that I do not know. And my ears went this big. She said, uh, there's a delegation of Canadian people, business people, that have arrived in Havana, and they're coming to do business here in Holguin. 
And we just got a phone call from the command center in Havana. We have a brand new Russian plane who's called an AM-26. It's part in the hangar here. And we just got a command from the office of the commander-in-chief. You know who that is in Cuba, right? That's Mr. Fidel Castro. And he just gave an order to fly a plane to Havana, to pick up those 25 days men and fly them back up to home game. And I'm going to do something. We're going to put you in that plane. Yeah. yeah. So, so now this is they put me in a military plane that was back in 1991, uh, May, uh, May 1991, no, the 20th of April, because my dad then died two days later on, on May 1st. They put me on a military plane with two bodyguards from the Secret Service, four air hostess, and they put me in the most wonderful view that that plane had. It was a very special plane designed for Castro's use. And they flew me to Havana. You know, when I landed there, they, escorted me out of the plane, put me in a taxi, paid by the government, they didn't know what they were doing, and they dropped me off right in front of the hospital where my dad was. Now, you need to understand what I'm giving you all these testimonies, you know, so you understand where I'm coming from. And Pastor Jerry, you have to tell me, is 12.25, do I have another 50 minutes left? Yeah? Okay. Do I have another 50 minutes left? Well, I just want to... Uh, just close this because I want you to know how good God is and all the stuff that He can do for you. Now, something interesting happened. When I go to the hospital to see my dad, I call two friends of mine, Miguelito and Ivan, that Pastor Gary knows, and I say, You really need to come here because I want to pray for my dad. When I get up there, my dad is in the intensive care unit. Everybody is dying. My sister is a psychologist working in that big hospital. And I used to hang out with a little, I don't do that anymore, but when you're young, you do a lot. I used to hang out with a little bottle of oil, you know, just to annoy people. It, because I was growing. I didn't know that I got to people without oil, too. You know, so I went into that place, and I took this young, to many to the intensive care unit. And for three days in a row, we went and prayed for every person that was dying in that place. Pray for every person who was dying. Three days later, my sister calls me. And she said, I need to talk to you right away. So I went on a bicycle to see my sister. And she said, the director of the hospital called me because she knows I'm your sister. And he had a prior meeting with me. And he asked me, he said, what in the world is your brother doing in the intensive care unit? Because we have the highest mortality rate in there. And for the past three days, nobody has died and everybody's improving. Yeah. Now, you need to understand this. This is not a story I have read in the book. And I appropriated the story, and then I give you my spin on it. No, I'm telling you what I saw, lived, firsthand. So this is a firsthand account. It's not a third-hand account. It's not a watered-down story, you know, from an old book. I live this stuff. Yes. So God is building up my life, teaching me that everything is by faith. I mean, life, everything is by faith. Faith comes by what? Yeah. By hearing. But so does fear. Fear also comes by hearing. No, faith is not the only thing that comes by hearing. Also fear. You know, and a lot of people, they either live their dreams or live their fears. You know, so God is teaching me, you know, you really have to uh, do, trust me at these levels. And you know, the reality is that when you go to new levels, you find new devils. Also, you find new uh, levels of glory and new, level, new levels of dealing with what's ahead of you. Because God will never bring you to a place where He will not give you the tools to overcome the giants in that place. You know, so you should never be afraid of growing, of facing a challenge, of going to the next level, because uh, resources will be available there. You know, that's the way it works. God doesn't call people that are prepared. God prepared those that He calls. You know, it's an amazing system. So you should never look at it and say, I'm deficient, I don't have it. I mean, actually, there's some words that you need to eliminate from your vocabulary. You know, there's some, because words have an amazing power. You know, they are incredible. They, they create so many circumstances in your life. You know, and words like errors. Once you throw those errors out there, I mean, you cannot go out and catch up with them. They, just, they struggle faster than you. You know, so... Uh, uh, there's something about the life of faith, you know, that really makes a person walk at the level that God wants them to walk, that God wants them to live. Well, to continue my story, because I don't want to take up your time, something amazing happened. We saw those miracles. Then, in 1992, I come to America for the first time to do a conference for the Methodist Church. People wanted me to defect here. But we had signed a moral code with my other friends in the Methodist Church that whichever of us we come to America first, we will not defect here. Because we felt that we need to come here legally. I mean, it's like, I mean, uh, if I live in a 
300 square foot place and you're my neighbor and you live in a 10,000 square foot home, I cannot say you have more than me, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move uh, your backyard. And then I'm gonna let you know, hey, I just move in. It's the right thing to do. No, you can't do that. So we've really understood, if we come and defect in America, two bad things are gonna happen. Then the U.S. Embassy in Cuba is gonna shut down doors of opportunity for my other people to come visit America because they're gonna see them as potential immigrants. I cannot do that to them. They have the right to also come travel and see this country. And the other thing is, I really wanna come to America in a way that is legal. That's what I purpose in my heart. I really wanna, because there's something about doing things right. I mean, I don't know how to explain it, but when you do things right, you unleash a process of rashness in your life. You know, so sometimes, you know, we believe, you know, that little thing don't matter. Well, I have different news. They do matter. I mean, it's just, uh, they do. I usually say, I told Pastor Deer that a, a, a half-truth is a whole lie. You know, so, and God is after integrity. You know what integrity means? It means being made of one piece. I mean, it's just, those things are very important to God. Now, something that is really interesting. I came to America, and I preached here and things like that, and I went back to Cuba. When I was in Miami, here to fly to Cuba, prophecies flew. People first time, those says the Lord, you know, you need to stay here. This is an opportunity the Lord gave you. I mean, people are coming to the street of Florida, dying and getting drunk to escape Cuba on, on, on boats and things like that. And, you know, God put it to you uh, uh, in, a, in a silver plate, and you're rejecting that opportunity. But, you know, there's something about the Holy Ghost right here that you know when something is right and you know when something is wrong i mean because you know the bible says something he said that he will guide you to all what truth i mean he will guide you to all things that has virtue truth is virtue incarnated you know so if you are if you do not know what is right but you're a man of integrity you will always do what is right i mean that's just the way it works and I didn't feel in my heart that I needed to defect it, so I put myself on the plane and flew back to Cuba. But when I landed at the Havana airport, you know, hell broke loose. Because when I landed there, it was militarized, everybody was sweating, you know, everybody was, you know, their hair was crazy, you know, people were hungry, they were looking at you with that dictatorship kind of, you know, eyes. And I had the image from the American airport when I landed in Miami, everybody was smiling at that time. Now they don't smile anymore. You know, but at the time when I landed, they would say, well, I was, uh, you know, an immigrant, everybody was happy, now everybody was saying weird. But, you know, I had just that, and I thought, what did I do? And then I began to have regrets. You know, I spoke buyer's remorse, you know, buy something you don't like it, you know. I began to have a lot of remorse. I should have stayed in America, I should have defected. But again, the thing kicks in, and I said, no, you should have. You should not have done that. Well, to make the long story short, because you really need to hear this, it's very important. When I went back to Cuba, because that act of faith, being 23 years old, saying no to freedom, and going back into that prison cell out of integrity, God said, I'm going to reward you. And I was doing a series of meetings, it's a part of Cuba, church about 200 people, and a supernatural move of God took place, and that's how I met Pastor Gary, that's how he heard of me. There was a hospital called the Celia Sanchez Mandolet Hospital, that was about four blocks or five blocks away from this Methodist church that was sitting on the corner. And on the second day of that meeting, I was having a lady that had been shot in her lower back, had been paralyzed for 10 years. She could not walk. I heard a voice of God when I said, I guess a good racer from the wheelchair. Now, when you hear something like that, you have a kind of thoughts in your head. You know, but it comes to time, a point where God says, I want you to connect what you believe with the reality and actuality of what you believe or what you proclaim. You know, and that's one of the hardest moments in your life. When you be teaching about giving for years, and then you're faced by something like that. When you be teaching about prosperity, or you be teaching that God is there, and you feel that He's not there, but in fact, God is always there. You know, it's just a matter of perspective. And I walked down with that youth, the boldness of my youth, and I pulled that woman out of the wheelchair, and I heard her bones cracking on the lower back. And she walked straight, got healed. The next day, from 200 people we had, we had 1,000 people in the church. We had to get the chairs out. They didn't actually have pews. And so people could stand, because you can put more people standing and sitting in a room. Well, in four days of that campaign, we had 8,000 people. Now, this was interesting. We didn't have radio to advertise. We didn't have television. We didn't have internet. We didn't have text. We didn't have cell phone. We had nothing. Have you heard the term, a move of God? 
you know, well, that was a move of God. That was doing. He was putting in, he, he produces in people the same two things. So the church was part of those people. Not only that, on the fifth day, the hospital is here in this movement of people that are walking wheelchairs and came up walking. So the chief of the intensive care unit there, Dr. Berta Vettinier, this is an, this is, sorry, this is an army. He's an epidemiologist, something that somebody that has to do with skin infections. And he suffers from a very severe form of psoriasis that is uh, produced by a retrovirus. You know, he's got all over his body, his arms, everything. And he comes down and he closes the intensive care unit and breaks down all the patients with him in crutches and stretches. And then he calls the church and says, what do we do with these people? So we clear in the morning the front and put you know, we made this place comfortable for all the sick people in the hospital and the doctor came to see people. And that night when we began to pray for sick people, those big, uh, uh, the rash that he had, the retrovirus, vanished in his eyes. People began to be healed and that's when really hell broke loose because the secret service of Cuba got in there and they accused me that I was embarrassing the work of the Cuban Revolution that had spent billions of dollars in the health system and here I was, you know, uh, promoting something different and people were coming out of the hospital. That was a fiasco, but it was a spiritual feast. Yeah. It was incredible. They put me in jail, they arrested me. I was 26 years old, I said, Lord, I don't want to die. It was a lot of different weird feelings, you know. You know that death has an amazing smell. When death is close to you, there's a, there's a smell that comes with it. It's just incredible. I don't know how to describe it. And I feel that, I thought I'm about to die, you know. So, but, Pastor Gary was in Cuba and they tell him you need to meet this guy that was just caught up in that. So that's the relationship started. We went to a hotel, made everything the first two hundred and fifty dollars somebody sold in my life. At that time it was a lot of money. That was a lot of money back in nineteen ninety three. Well at that time I would make about four dollars a month and a pair of jeans would cost seventeen dollars and a bottle of uh, of cooking oil was about fifteen dollars just to give an idea you know so you have to work about three or four months to buy a bottle of cooking oil or three months to buy a pair of jeans and that's how it was when pastor Gary just saw and gives me an offer of two hundred fifty dollars he saw the salary of what uh, that's the salary like about five uh, uh, five months or six months or something like that it's incredible I became rich overnight uh, you know it's just it's the incredible feeling now let me just conclude with this uh, then I came back to the USA for the second time and they asked me you need to defect again because if you don't defect you will not have an opportunity to come back to the United States again and when you go back they're going to persecute you even more but I really again have the integrity clock in my heart I cannot do that so I put myself and I came visit in this country with a legal visa I put myself on a plane back in Miami knowing I'm going back to hell and I went back to hell at that time hell really broke loose major persecution uh, imprisonment twice, detention in places, phone calls, harassment. I mean, it was just incredible, incredible. Pastor Year was with me in a car that we rented and we were doing a conference in the East part of Cuba that we, everybody believes that on purpose they did something in the wheel because we're driving about 70 kilometers an hour at night and all of a sudden the car began to spin and I mean, we didn't get killed by a miracle of God. You know, that was an amazing experience. That was back in 1994. You know, so life, uh, it was good ministerial, but it was bad in that sense. But I'm going to tell you why I'm telling you all the stories. And uh, I'm going to wrap it up in a way that you're going to love it. Uh, I went back, and I had met my wife already here, a beautiful American girl that I love with all my heart, the only wife I had, you know, for 20 years. And when I decided to come back to marry my wife here in the States, I go back and the Cuban government said, you are not going to live now. And I go back to the U.S. Embassy in Havana to go ahead and apply for a visa, see if I can do And the U.S. is to say, you are not going to go back to the United States ever because you're a possible immigrant and we know that you're going to stay. I said, I've been two times and I have not defected. They said, we don't care, they were really mad. And they put in my, my Cuban passport, big stamp that says, denied. And underneath it was a line that I remember it says, application received. And you go into the American computer system, the world, and even if I leave Cuba and fly to the other side of the world, and I apply in another embassy in the side of the world, my nation's up, they won't let me get it. So that was a curse. You know, when you're denied, that's a curse. Because you have the hope to come and you can't. 
So I called my fiance, my wife came at that time and said, I cannot marry you in the United States. I mean, there's no way I can do it. I mean, they, they will not allow me to go. So my wife flies into Cuba with her family. That was a great thing to do. They went to Bahamas and they went to Cuba. She flies with all her savings. She had $3,000 in savings. You know, so she went in there and we got married in Cuba. What I want to tell you this story that you need to know. After you get married, you, you're looking forward to the honeymoon. I mean, that's just the way it works. I mean, you're looking forward. You say, you know, this woman, I can't wait to put my hands in her. You know, and I know that in an American way, she's thinking the same way. I can't wait to put my hands in the Latino guy. You know, and you believe that she's really white. I'm a little bit tan, you know, and I was muscular at that time. Now, you know, I have a lot of fat, but at that time I was muscular. So the green girl, I mean, she couldn't wait to put her hand in me either. You know, Latinos were very real. That's, you know, that's the way we talk. So we get married today, and we had to go back to the U.S. Embassy and explain we're a married couple. Only, but we knew the the person at the nine my business who working there was the consul, and we didn't have a honeymoon. They gave us our friends blessings to the hotel, and guess what we did at that hotel? We had no sex and no honeymoon. That was the worst thing that we did. We, my wife and I, got a covenant that we were going to fast for three days in that hotel room. Now, can you believe for a Latino guy, young fool, the testosterone? That's a big challenge. <laughs> you know, the same room. I mean, I can explain that to you. And when I met my wife, she was a virgin. I mean, she had never had a man. I mean, she just wanted to experience what was a man and the man that she loved, you know, a man that was full of God. So for three days, we locked ourselves in that room and we didn't touch each other. Speaking in tongues and praying and bringing the word of God to the balcony of your father, you know, just doing a lot of stuff. I mean, spiritually, because sometimes you have to move the Bible to, you know, the letters. You know, you just cannot get caught up fighting down here only. And you know what? And uh, I don't know it was Pastor Sally that said this last night, and that thing really hit home with me what you say. When you say that you believe that there's two things that some people sometimes don't know, is sometimes they don't know when they're on the demonic attack. You know, and that is a very truthful statement. A lot of people go through things and they attribute it to everything and they don't even stop to think that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And if you ignore that, then you don't know how to fight properly. Right. So we went there to do some serious warfare. No spooky, we're stupid warfare. You know, no this stuff. No, Bible-based, rooted, established, declaring, confessing, believing, standing in faith, believing God. And the third day, we felt released, closed the fire, uh, the fence. I went to the U.S. Embassy, trembling and shaking. And there were three windows. And when I look at this window, there's the person that denied me the visa last time. And I'm looking, oh Lord, I'm trying to move this way to be in front of the other person. It's another American person because it was nice, it was mild. I want this guy. And I move over here and this guard, security guard comes and pulls me from here and said, you are going to be in this window. <sighs> and puts me in front of the lady that denied me the visa. And I thought, you know, this is it. And I went up there. And when I gave my password, she looked at me and put it, she sees her sin and she said, oh, you're the one. But inside the U.S. section, when you get married with an American citizen overseas, then they pull you, both of you separated, and they ask you questions because they want to make sure that it's not a marriage of convenience. They want to make sure you really get married. So my wife entered in the meeting first and then they usher her back to that door and they pull me into here with the same officer and he asked me questions like, uh, when was the last time you had sex with your wife? Or where was your honeymoon? Uh, questions, uh, what color underwear were you wearing yesterday? And then they ask him the same question too. Well, when they ask her a question, what was the last time you had sex? It was like, uh, we have not had sex yet. You know, we got married about four days ago. You know, we had, and she comes and said, well, we haven't. And then when they called in there, I said the same thing, well, to be honest with you, we haven't. But it happened to be that the guy, the officer is doing that interview, he's a Puerto Rican guy. And he attended a mega church in Puerto Rico, who's a man of God. And he looked at me and he says, I understand what you're doing, and I understand the spiritual world. He, and he was the director of the INS in Havana. He was the ultimate, was even in more authority than the lady that the name of the visa. 
and he took my passport and he stamped a big stand that says approved. I said, go back to the lady that didn't you. And I went back to the lady that didn't know she looked at me and she said, I knew that you were going to go to the United States of America, but there's nothing I can do. And she put the second stamp approved. Yes. You know, so we put ourselves in the point. These are amazing things that I want to know. We landed in Miami. And then my wife had a Honda Accord, and we drove to Jacksonville, rented a condominium. We had no money, no furniture. I landed in the United States with $25, and my wife had about $15. So total wolf at the time was about $40. You know, and uh, one of the things at the time, gas was about 89 cents a gallon. You know, that was the only good thing on the body. You know, so we rented this 2100 square foot condominium, no furniture. I was in the past a year, I remember saying, and I, fly, and I drive to here with my wife, recently the marriage. And I speak in the church, and the first offering they gave me, you know, I'm, uh, hallelujah, I have this offering in my pocket. It's this little church. It made about $700 offering. I put it in my pocket and I was shopping. And a friend of mine that's a millionaire, right Friday, and another friend of Jerry, that's a missionary to Mexico, they uh, called Jerry, you know, we like to take, you know, Juan Carlos out. So then we went to my favorite restaurant in Houston, Papa Cities. And then we went there, and there's this guy that is a millionaire, has a lot of money, and this other guy has been in ministry for years, has a lot of resources. And when we order all uh, this meal, the bill comes up to seventy-six dollars. But before that, he's telling me, he said, "You know, I have a vision about giving a million Bibles to Mexico, and uh, you know, with it, for every dollar that I get donated, I can buy a Bible and they donate in Mexico." And I love Mexico. I have a lot of you know Mexican friends there. So when he said that, I heard a voice of God again, "Give me seven hundred dollars." I thought, "Oh my goodness!" I thought, "You know, the Lord blessed me yesterday. It was time to rip me off today." <laughs> Yes, I know she has got a from Mexico and it for Cuba. You know, but let me tell you something. It's not just what you believe. It's what you obey. Yes. All right. Because we put a lot of emphasis over years on faith, and that's a wonderful thing. But something transcends faith. And you know what? This is obedience. Because if you don't have a big faith, but you have an obedient spirit, the stuff that will come to your life is incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's about obedience. And I gave you $700 and I didn't give it. I was not a sure food giver. I was a mad, bitter giver. You know, really, you know, you, you, you're not talking about... In that case, God really blessed the bitter giver. Because I gave it out of obedience, not out of joy. You know, but obedience is a powerful force. I gave it. Not only that, when the bill comes 76 years old, the Lord speaks to me and said, Also, by the way, pay the bill too. So, I just paid the bill. Well, when I come back, at Jerry's office, the phone rings. Pastor Gary picks up the phone and in front of his calling. I forgot his name, the guy, I don't know. But it's the Pastor Gary, you know, I, uh, he had a big workhouse, you know. Larry, that's right. And Larry calls Pastor Gary and says, you know, I have a big workhouse and somebody has donated to me $50,000 worth of brand new furniture from Harpies. He said, do you know a missionary that needs furniture that he can come and take with once? And Gary says, I have it right here with me. So we went to the store, and with a $700 offering that I gave the guy in a 70 cent bill meal, I was able to furnish my home with about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars worth of top of the land furniture. Right. You know, that's just how it went. Well, I just ended all this testimony stuff. But this scripture in the ten minutes that I have left, uh, we went there, and my wife was 36 years old. I'm two years younger than her. And one day I'm coming back from Mexico per se, in a town called Querétaro. And when I come back, my wife is kind of sad in the room. And I said, baby, what happened? And she looked at me with those big blue eyes, uh, blue eyes, blue hair, well, she's not blue anymore. But uh, she looked at me and she said with this kind look, she said, honey, make me a baby. I'm 36 years old. She could not have babies. And we have tried, you know, for four years. And I have no idea, no way to explain to you what that meant. I said, baby, this is not in my power. The next day at 5 o'clock in the morning, the little old man, I went to a church in town that I had the entry code, the father's house. My friend pastor was Seboski, who was a Cuban guy that loved me. And he gave me an entry code to his mega church. He said, this is your place, do what you want. And I went to pray about 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. And I remember when I heard the voice of God, so I'm going to give you two voices. I'm going to give you two voices. And I thought he meant that your wife's going to birth one now and then one later. And God was specific, I'm going to give you twins. I went back home and I told my wife, and the next day, we went to Tampa to see her mama. Her mama has a piano. It's 7 o'clock in the morning, I play a little bit of piano. I get up and worship the guy, my wife is 
fixing breakfast. And she fixes his breakfast and she comes running from the kitchen when she cracks and he says, Honey, look! And she showed me when she cracked an egg, they had two yolks. And we were thinking, oh, hallelujah, the Lord, because the Lord had told me, and she know what I told her. And she was excited. You can tell the look of a woman like that, that she's dying. I mean, she wants a babies. You know, when she says that, when she goes back to the kitchen, when she cracks the second egg, she screams, breaks out in tears in the kitchen. I run thinking something happened. And she's holding in her hand the bowl with another egg with two yolks. And the Lord spoke to me and said, begin to declare it. Everywhere you go, get a testimony, you're going to have two boys. I thought, if I say that, it doesn't happen, it's the end of my ministry. You lose very built. But we began to believe that and believe that. Well, 10 days later, my wife runs a test. She's pregnant. Everybody's throwing a party in her house. And we're believing God. Three and a half months later, she has not had a son around. And she went to the doctor for a doctor's appointment. And they could not hear the baby's heartbeat. So the doctor is concerned and is getting the son around right there in the office to see what's going on. Because, you know, the world always has this negative thinking. When they don't understand something, they default to think something bad is happening. Right. When believers, we should have the thinking that it's the opposite. When we don't understand what is happening, we believe that God is doing something great. Yeah. You know, and uh, they're having this negative thought. When they knew the Son of God, they turned, as he said, and said, this is the reason why we're going to hear the baby, Harvey. Because you don't have one baby. You have two boys. You have two babies. Yeah. And two separate percentages. And we went... Of thankfulness to Then Dr. Rebecca Moorhead, who was a Methodist doctor, who was a gynecologist, sat with us and said, Listen, your wife is 36 years old, she's going to have birth at 37. She's a high risk lady, very high risk. You know, so let me tell you how it happens in all these cases. In that case, you know, usually the way it works is we do a test, we have to punch in there to see if the baby's going to be down syndrome or not. You know, and the other thing I would say, if the baby is healthy, you know, you probably need to spend uh, your babies to be pretty much here. They come about, you know, 10 weeks in advance. They might come at six months, you know, about 25 weeks, I mean, pregnancy. And also, usually, they weigh about four pounds. And usually, if she is, she said lucky, she didn't have this language to speak. If she's lucky enough, I would have said she's blessed enough, she would birth the first one naturally. The second one gets stuck. Usually, they get stuck in the birth canal and went to the C-section. But my wife is a faith lady. And when, my, when that doctor said that, my wife said, well, I'm sorry. He said, I am not going to have that test done because there was a risk that you could kill things. Second of all, I am not going to birth my babies prematurely. They're going to weigh four pounds. You know, I don't know to have a secession. Because I don't like to have a secession. My wife stood by that. I bought a book called What to Spec When You're Specting. I play guitar. And every time that the book said, well, in week so-and-so, the kidneys are being formed, we will sing to the kidneys. I'm prophesying to the kidneys of my boys. You know, when the, lungs, uh, the heart was being formed, the lungs and music were prophesying and singing, and declaring and singing. My wife had a phenomenal pregnancy. She was so pregnant, she could not put her hands around her belly. Well, can I tell you something? At week 40, my wife was not given birth yet. We had to go to the hospital for her to be induced. She passed about 42 weeks. You know, my boys came up weighing three boys, eight pounds each. My wife birthed two eight pound boys. And my wife birthed them naturally. She didn't have a succession. You know, so the reason why I tell them the things is because what God can do for you, not only what God can do, because you used to think there's a big difference in the revelation when you have the revelation of what God can do versus when you have the revelation of what God is willing to do. You know, some people, who in this whole world does know that God is capable to do everything? I mean, the Bible says you believe that there's one God, you do well, but even demons believe and tremble. So the, the, the big thing that, that really thrills God's heart is not your knowledge of His power, it's your knowledge of His will. Because the power of God cannot be claimed unless the will of God is known. If you don't know what the many offers, you cannot order. You know, so knowing what God is willing to do for you is an amazing contributor to your faith. I mean, you can walk in a different dimension. And this is how I close this whole thing. And I have five minutes left, right? Founded a church in Jacksonville. Bought a building down in Cash, in the city of Marijuana for a friend of mine. But my whole point is that I never got anything without having to use my faith and without putting up a good fight. It's never been easy for me. For other people, it's been a piece of cake, but it's not. Ah. For me, it's never been easy. Now, also, it's never been impossible. It's always been possible. You know, the book, the book of Kings says that when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed as king, they declared war against him. The day that he was anointed, the next day they declared war. And here's what I learned in spiritual warfare. 
the anointing, stir things up. See, there are things that you want and things that you need. And what I is that God will give you what you want before He gives you what you need. That's how He works in His spiritual economy. Now, God's not going to give you the next level for free. You're going to have to earn it. And I usually say new, new levels, you encounter new levels, but listen, that was exactly the story of David in the Bible. The prophet Samuel went to David's house, and before David's father and David's brother endorsed him, anointed him as the new king of Israel, you know, gave him all the opportunity. But you know what? That didn't do anything for David. Absolutely nothing. His brothers didn't admire him more, didn't respect him more. I mean, he was no privilege after that at all. Because sometimes you're looking for men's approval, forget about it, just support like that. You know, but when David faced and killed Goliath, then he became known, admired, and respected. Now listen, when God wants to take you to the next level, trust me, he's going to release a giant in your life. And Goliath was made to make David known. Sometimes we've been running away from a giant, and that's the very thing that is going to get you out of the trouble you've always been believing to be set free from. So we cannot have escape mentality. I mean, we can, you know, fleeing away from a conflict doesn't make it go away. I mean, you have to hit it with your faith as hard as you can. You know, and if it wasn't for Goliath, David would have never made it to the palace. What pushed David to the top was the person that he had to face. And the difference was, you know, the difference between David and Goliath was no size or stature, it was a piece of skin. That David was a master of size, wasn't very common, and Goliath wasn't. That was different. People think it was size, forget about size. The difference was covenant. Now, you have a covenant, a greater order today. I mean, something incredible. Uh, you know, the same thing happened with Joseph in Egypt. His brother betrayed him, his brothers betrayed him into slavery. That's what we think, but it's not true. They betrayed him into his divine destiny. If he had not been by the hatred and betrayal of his brother Joseph, would have never become the center of his family. Yeah. When years later he was given the opportunity to seek revenge, and you know what? The devil is going to give you the opportunity to seek revenge. I get it. Don't do that. Pass on that opportunity. But when he was given the opportunity to seek revenge, in Genesis 45, 6, he orders an amazing word. He says, so now, his brother started is trembling in front of him, thinking that he's going to kill him. He speaks to his brother and so says, listen, now, it was not you who sent me here, but it was God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. And the teaching in my heart is that Joseph saw the hand of God, or other people would have seen the hand of men. Or other people should have seen the hand of the devil. You need to see, to learn how to see God in everything. In everything. Don't look at verse and just the devil did that to me, brother, the devil did that to me. You get that out of your language. You know, the true mark of a Christian is giving and forgiving. Those are the true marks. And you know, this is what I learned because I have to forgive a lot in my life. You cannot get ahead in life by trying to get in. You cannot do that. The colonel in the Cuban military that made me and my life, my wife, my mom, my dad's life miserable, responsible almost for my dad death. I went to Cuba about six months ago and I went to see him. He's retired already. He's, you know, an alcoholic. I knocked at his door. He said, You remember me? He looked at me with the other one. He said, I'm Juan Carlos. What's your name? The one you did. But I'm here to let you know that, you know, I'm compelled to love you and let you know I forgive you and have peace if you feel that you did something wrong to me. Forget about it. And here's the thing, if you want to live a miserable life, then hate somebody. Right. That's the formula to live miserable. Hate somebody. And forgiveness is like drinking poison and wishing the other person would die. That's exactly what forgiveness is. I hate her so much, I'm going to drink poison, I wish she would die. No, you will die. And the last thing here, listen, when God speaks to you, you have to become one with this word. And really open up to all this stuff. And another thing that is really wonderful, that I want you to really get. This is the walk away. I remember the day the Lord spoke to me this word and said, have you eaten my words yet? I never knew what eating God's word meant. And let me explain, God used Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, in powerful ways. Ezekiel used powerful prophetic demonstrations to send a message of warning to Israel. And sometimes those messages came at a great discomfort of people. Because true prophets, 
they really don't have the appreciation of the masses. They have the appreciation of the remnants, or the people that have the same hunger. And you know, you're something interesting. The closer you get to God, the more is reduced the number of people that want to walk with you. The closer you get to God, the people that want to walk with you is reduced. And people don't leave you. Because sometimes as pastors, when somebody leaves us, we get wounded. Because we love people sincerely. I mean, ministry is not a money-making machine. We do this out of pure call and love. I mean, this is not to make money. I mean, you're passing out from here. It's not make Pastor Jerry rich or anything. God is blessed already. He really doesn't need your money. Now, God loves through him. You know, Pastor Sally Trump, she's a blessed woman too. So it's not about money. I don't know if you understand. You know, so when somebody leaves you, that's, I mean, my heart really, his heart was about to leave me. But here's what I learned. This is what God spoke to me that really brought peace to me. And it could be your basis, a friendship that leaves you. You know, people don't leave you because they find something better. They leave you because they find something easier and less costly. Yeah. That's, that's the reason why they do it. It's not because they find something better than you. But that's what we think. They left because they found something better. No. They found something easier. Less costly. You know, and all this pain that Ezekiel went through in his prophetic ministry was part of becoming one with his message. And it began with the Lord telling him, you need to eat this scroll, puppy. I mean, eat this scroll. <laughs> he said, Leon, you're shining. We're talking about that today. And then speak. Eat this scroll. <laughs> As a church, you're establishing God's kingdom here. This is it. And I cannot, I cannot have time. I mean, I'm sorry. But uh, maybe next time I can go into all this stuff in the work that we have learned. But I just want to let you know that God is a great God. And it doesn't matter where you are. When I moved to Miami to plant a church, I went with a lot of money there about six years ago and everything. And it was a move, it was a God move, but it came with a big price. You know, and I lost almost everything. And one day I'm walking to my Bible school. I'm driving a bicycle six miles in Miami Heat. And I'm having a thought, Lord, you brought me to Miami. And people are going to think that you brought me here to ridicule me and break your pieces. Because good thoughts come. You know, and you cannot control it. I mean, the thought that comes to your head. You have control what you allow to stay in your head. But you really cannot control what comes to it. Sometimes you pray right there in a holy moment. I have a nasty thought that comes to my head. I said, where I came from? It's like a UFO. I didn't see that coming. You know, how can I nasty fall in the altar? Well, it's not. The, the thing is that it's not my fault. The devil said, here, you want to entertain this? I said, no. He said, Martin Luther said, I can, no, I can do nothing. I cannot keep the version flying around my head. But I can sure keep it from building a nest on it. You know, so there are things you cannot control. The things that come from the outside is out of control. Now, whether you let it get in or out, that's really out of your control. So I'm driving this bicycle. And I'm having the thought, well, long story short, I don't have money to do crochets anymore, I don't have a budget. Well, a man of God from Venezuela comes into my life, asks me for breakfast, we have breakfast. I share one of my books about the way they always like there and they want to enjoy them. And he said, you have a thousand books in your office? I said, yeah. He said, I want you to sell it for us, we'll give you 10 or 50 dollars. Well, he bought a thousand books, gave about 10,000 dollars in books. Not only that, he said, I want to pay for a crochet in Venezuela. Flew me in his private plane to Venezuela. Came home his private plane, flew me there to Venezuela. Then paid for the University of Carabobo in Valencia. Brought thousands of people, packed the place, paid for everything. Gave me, a, I think it was about a $2,000 offering. Gave me a golden Rolex that I gave it away. I don't wear fancy stuff. You know, gave me a Rolex. Not only that came, he said, you know, I need to learn from you. He rented a house across my street in Miami. Let his company run it. You know, with other people moved to Miami, across from Miami. He said with his wife. For three months, sat in my church every service. And before he left, he called me one night at 12 30 and he gave me both the $45,000 out of it. And when he did that, the Lord told me, I can pay for your cars, I can pay for your crochets, I can pay for your books. So I didn't bring you to Miami to really kill you here. Yeah. And I pray for you. You're wonderful people. You're a wonderful group of people. But be bold. And you know what? Heal. Heal internally, but heal quickly. Don't waste six months to heal. Heal today. I mean, let go, you know? Heal, forgive, move on. 
I mean, you cannot drive your car looking to rear view mirror. I mean, it's not going to be a good experience. You want to move forward, don't look backward. It's a new beginning. Don't compare, don't complete. Don't compete, don't compare. Don't think that the old times were better. Don't think about what you lost. I mean, what it could have been, the coulda, shoulda, woulda. Forget about all that. That's no fake language. That's just regret ignorance. And that's a lot of inner distress and inner hurt. And God not only calls to be healthy, He calls not to be healed, but to have wholeness. It's a different thing. You cannot run. You cannot go to the Olympics and run 100 meters with your feet full of blisters. And in the body of Christ, a lot of people, you know, that are wounded healers. Don't do that. There's a provision in the Old Testament that says, God said to Moses, speak to the priest. And your priest, all of us are priests and king. He says, none of my priests would ever dare to get closer to the altar with a bleeding sword. God forbid bleeding people to ministry. So if you want to be effective and get close to his presence, you have to heal. You have to be whole. And when do you know you're whole when you don't talk about it anymore? As long as you talk about it, it's dead. I don't know if you understand. Because we have better things ahead of us. God has not called us here to be a church of 150. You have outstanding pastors. If I was here, this is the church I would be part of. Not just to be a pupil taker right there. I would be here to serve. To commit, to give my life and say, I am here unconditionally. Use me, Lord Pastor, what can I do? And I know you're that type of people. Let's just stand up for a minute. And I want to bless you. You're really beautiful. I'm going to have your pastor call and he's going to take you from now. He's going to make the answer call. But I want to let you know that there's great things for you ahead. There's phenomenal things for you ahead. There's great things for you ahead. There's phenomenal things for you ahead. It's wonderful. I was in a crusade one day and I woke down and a woman came up to me and the Spirit of God came up and told me, tell her that she needs to come out of the place she came out. And what the Lord told her is, your body came out of that environment, but your spirit is still there. So a breakthrough requires that you come out twice in the same place. You first come out physically and then spiritually. I mean, you have to get out of your spirit at certain seasons of your life, certain moments, I mean, certain experiences. If you're still lingering there spiritually, you're not free yet. You're half free. But half of freedom is a whole bondage. And ultimate freedom is your goal. Amen? Amen. Father, I just want to bless these wonderful people. I see not only destiny, but I see potential. I see diamonds in the rough. I see this ministry, Lord. I see potential expander. And Father, I speak this word in simple terms, believe it with Pastor Gary and Pastor Sally, that this next season, it will be a season of maturity, growth, strength. It's been a season, Father, of defining objectives, goals, strategies. And I pray that a spirit of evangelism, soul winning, a prophetic utterance from heaven would breathe through this ministry that we will all go to the level that you have established for us before the foundation of the world. Father, and I just pray that in every, that ministries that are needed to take this vision to that level would arise today, that you would birth passion for the ministry of intercession, for the ministry, for the prophetic ministry, for the ministry of deliverance. Father, that you would birth passion for the ministry of business men and women, the paid masters that are going to finance the harvest in this ministry. Father, that you can raise up everything that is needed as you command the team of you to set up in order the things that are lacking. You know, that we would see this ministry fulfilling walking the eternal path. And I thank you, Lord, I thank you in advance that you're going to bring people here. You're going to add Add to this harvest those who are going to be part of that which is being predetermined. In the name of Jesus, every sickness and every disease in this place, Father. We thank you that you are the healer and sickness is an attack to redemption. And Father, we do not understand all the how you were that in our lives and body, but we understand one thing. You're a good God. You are a merciful God. 
You're a good, loving God, Father. You're not a God of judgment for the believers. I thank you that you already judged Jesus for me, Father. That my judgment was upon Jesus. I thank you that for us there's no judgment. For us it's maybe discipline, maybe correction, but most of us it's affection and love and care. And I thank you that we're not under the curse of the law anymore. Father, we're under the amazing grace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. I thank you that every sickness is lifted from the body. Every sickness, every woman that cannot give birth here, Father, in the name of Jesus, I know that you open that womb today. The miracle takes place today right now. That every cyst, every cancer, every cyst, every uh, 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 thing in, uh, in their breast is healed, dissolved, disappeared. And we will not, Father, have to have a ministry that deals with death, but a ministry that deals with life. In the name of Jesus and Master. Pastor Jerry, thank you so much. I'm sorry that I took the extra minute.